Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Pulaski, Department Chair of English, Foreign Language, and English Center, the second language here at Hudson Valley Community College. So for this uh, session, uh, we're basically looking at from pilot to uh, practicality in basically our uh, open uh, educational resources and at least integrating them into our composition courses. So with the presentation itself, uh, pretty much we're just breaking it up into three parts here. It's basically how our uh, pilot program got started and how it's going with the adoption of the OERs after one year, and then taking a look at the future of what we may be considering here as part of uh, of our OER initiative here, uh, at least in our department this, uh, from here on out. So with our history with uh, OERs, uh, we started getting on board you know, uh, when it first came out in 2017 with our library skills course and then our uh, uh, foreign language instructor who specializes in French, Spanish, and Italian. Uh, she came up with some OERs as well. And then that started growing into some of our other uh, courses, which includes communications, public speaking. And then uh, I, was, as I was starting to look at... Uh, composition course, or at least OERs for composition courses, I was also starting to think about my uh, technical writing class or writing for technicians, which I eventually uh, found some OER sources with the help of the librarian at the time uh, to put that into my uh, course. And But as I said, 2019, we were still trying to figure out if there were any resources available. And that actually was limited at that, at least at that point, uh, going to the spring of that uh, semester. However, uh, the pandemic has made things a little bit interesting for us uh, because at that point we were starting to look at our textbook adoption uh, and vote for that because uh, we were due to determine if we were going to stay with it or choose another uh, publisher. And uh, at that point, as we had seen, at least I've seen over the last few years, that the margin for the textbook adoption was getting shorter. Basically, what we were currently using or what we had been using to what other people wanted to consider that at that point. And one of those options was OERs. And so uh, as we got into the uh, fall semester with the pandemic, students were having a hard time getting access to the ebook for the uh, uh, publishing uh, book that we had been using. And um, faculty said, yes, let's think about considering OERs. So a few of us were starting to look at um, OERs that were available at that point. And obviously, Lumen had just come out with uh, their own for Comp 1 and Comp 2. So that November, uh, we started forming a committee for this pilot program that included myself and, uh, and eight other faculty. So over the next couple of months, we started looking at the Lumen product uh, that includes the uh, core, core requisite and Waymaker, which is the uh, supplemental product uh, that you can integrate uh, some activities and other uh, material as well. And then the fall of 21, we started, you know, really putting into play uh, with just a handful of courses that uh, the, the nine faculty were teaching at that point. So what we have been using and currently using are basically these OERs. And pretty much most of our faculty have been working with Lumen uh, for Comp 1 and Comp 2. Uh, but we've also been look, working with Pressbooks, Quillbot, LibreText, uh, some of the products that have already been mentioned in the other sessions here uh, today. But as I said, for most of us, you know, we've been working with uh, the Lumen product itself. Uh, but for uh, our ESL instructors, uh, they've also been working with uh, another uh, OER that's you know, focusing, so, solely focused focused on uh, college ESL writers. So again, we we're just trying to figure out and trying to find out what sources are available uh, for, you know, at least for our students. So they're not, you know, relying on a textbook that at least at that point. But there's some other things that we've been using as well, at least supplemental materials. And that would include YouTube, TED Talk videos, uh, online writing labs, or at least websites that include Excelsior and Purdue uh, Al. And then we also have other sources that include uh, articles from the library, uh, library guides, even student essays that we have used in the past with permission of those students. Uh, but there's also much more. And that much more, it would include uh, the reading bank that we've been you know, pretty much working on over the, not only just the pilot program, but definitely over the, uh, this you know, past year. It's just adding reading selections that we maybe found in the previous textbook or maybe other readings that we just found that may be uh, deemed suitable for our writing course itself. So with the help of the library, uh, with just not only just putting uh, the OER textbooks available uh, through a library guide, we're also trying to get uh, a library uh, guide of all the uh, selected readings that we have currently have currently on the Excel uh, file. So we're, this is still a work in progress, but uh, we currently have, I think, about 180 uh, readings to choose from for our Comp 1 and Comp 2 classes uh, that, you know, some are accessible online through um, 
open spaces or open resources. Others are through a paywall or not maybe phrase it, not a paywall, but through a proxy server, uh, through the library itself. So we you know, we were starting to really start building a um uh, an asset or asset of resources for the reading bank themselves. So the part I want to focus on here is just, you know, how has the pilot program been working? Uh, so first, I wanted to look at our comp one classes themselves and say, well, you know, how did it go the first year? How did it go the second year uh, in comparison to the textbook to the OERs that we we're using? The part I'm really focusing on here, you know, like two areas are just the passing and the withdrawals. Uh, so with passing uh, the classes or the sections that had the OERs, uh, you know, 66% of the students were passing that class compared to 62% were still using that textbook. And we also saw not as many students were withdrawing, but the I, I kind of, you know, hedge myself on the uh, withdrawals because a lot of times the withdrawal may not be anything relevant to the course itself. It may be some other issues that the student may be encountering that may be preventing from the student going to class, uh, or maybe they did a total withdrawal, which is included in that count. So really, I just more so focus on uh, the, the rate of just passing in those who didn't pass the course, which, again, was a lot better with the OER out of the first year. Second year, uh, the numbers weren't as good. Uh, you know, that includes the textbook and the OER. And there's several variables to that. If you look at the fall spring semester of 2021, uh, not as, you know, we didn't have as many students on a campus. So students were still learning remotely, either through a Zoom class or maybe some sense of a, a hybrid or maybe even uh, just solely online. But when students were starting to return to the uh, to the campus, uh, we saw that they, they were struggling just uh, that well, well beyond the course itself. But Still, even then, the OERs were still, you know, ga at least gaining, um, at least not necessarily favorability, but were performing better for our students than those who were using the textbooks themselves. Uh, the other part I look at here is gen ed assessment, uh, which I think is an important part of our um, our composition courses. So with our comp one classes, we really focus on the communication goal. Well, actually, we focus on two communication goal goals, uh, the first one being the written, the other being the oral, but I really focus on the written because that's where we use a lot of our resources coming out of the OER or the textbook itself. And again, the students who uh, were in the OER classes did perform a little bit better with the uh, research paper, paper where they either met or exceeded the, uh, uh, you know, the standard for uh, the research paper. Compared to the spring, uh, it was the other way around. But I would say uh, another factor I would say in regards to uh, the following year, was you know with uh, enrollment changing, students were looking at different sections, different classes, which means I had to work with different faculty load, and some of the faculty were reassigned to other courses that were once uh, with the OERs. You could pretty much see the difference, and just even two classes could make a difference in the percentage here of those who met or exceeded uh, the uh, the comp one research paper itself. But it's still, I, I'm not disappointed with uh, you know the outcome of the. Uh, of uh, students meeting or exceeding the research paper just based off the OER compared to the textbook itself is relatively, to me, I think it's similar numbers other than maybe just a 1.1% difference. With COP2, uh, this is the other uh, course that we had used with our OERs. Again, uh, with the OERs performing better uh, than the textbooks out of the first year, but again, the second year, uh, a lot of things were changing. And you definitely can see with uh, the number of classes that were uh, using OERs, uh, where 18 uh, out of the first year, only 10 were offered out of the second year. Part of that had to do with uh, schedule changes. Uh, since some faculty were losing uh, classes because of literature courses, I had to compensate for them with uh, uh, Comp 2 classes, which means that they were using more, those who were, uh, you know, who needed those Comp 2 classes were still using the textbook at that point, which could be a possibility why uh, this passing rate was a little bit higher. But again, still not disappointed with the outcome uh, of, of the OER uh, you know, at least uh, we had used as part of the pilot program. So now we're looking at how it's going and where, at least where we are, at, the, at least at this point, after one year. So when I look at grade distribution, uh, you know, it's still similar to what we had, you know, seen out of our, um, at least the first year of our pilot program, but the number 62.7% is pretty much similar to what it was before the pandemic. So, you know, with that in mind, you know, we're, you still have, you know, 10% of the students are not passing. Again, 27% who are withdrawing from COP1, it could be an array of reasons that go beyond the the, uh, the course itself. And uh, so I, what I ended up doing is taking out the withdrawal um, 
percentage and just focus on those who passed and who didn't pass. And I think when I'm looking at 87% of our students passing comp one, uh, you know, with, you know, with the OERs now, to me, I think I'm, you know, pretty much satisfied with that, uh, that aspect of it. And with comp two, Definitely a lot better, uh, you know, not only just with uh, the grade distributions for you know, includes withdrawals, but more importantly, 90% of the students who now with the use of OERs are passing COP2 as well. So uh, to me, I think, you know, it's definitely promising here and in, uh, in, in just trying to, you know, not only just, you know, currently what we're using, but see what else we could do uh, going beyond. Uh, so along with the data that uh, I've you know, collected through our planning and research department, uh, we also put out um, surveys for our students and faculty to just kind of get a feel what they, uh, what, at least what they think about the, uh, the OERs themselves. Uh, and one of the things we asked them about was just how much they spent on uh, textbooks. And you know, 60, over 60% 60 of our students are still spending uh, somewhere between 100 to 500 hours on textbooks itself. And with the previous textbook that we had uh, used, uh, it was basically a, a writing handbook and a, you know, and a, what we call a reader, which is a collection of essays. And that was probably about $150. So if you threw $500 on top of, uh, of uh, the 150, you're looking at $650 for one student at, at that point. And I'm looking at the high end. So if we could find some way to just help reduce the cost of this, um, at least what students are paying for textbooks, you know, definitely I could see that being helpful for them. But, you know, based on the survey and, um, you know, get to, you know, what they thought about the uh, uh, the cost and how it benefited them, they did give some uh, feedback on the quality of the OERs that we had used through Lumen uh, and some of the other uh, products as well. And basically almost 90% of them, you know, at least 89% of them said it was either excellent or good. Uh, it means that, you know, we, maybe we did our job in this area to not only just help them save money, but also to provide a quality product here as well. So I got to really give credit to Lumen to provide a good product for our students so far, at least that they do appreciate that. As for the reading bank, um, Again, a little over 80% of them said that it was excellent or good. Those who said it was fair or poor could be you know, more so fair. Maybe it wasn't the reading selections that they wanted. And the best thing about working with the reading bank is that we can always switch out uh, readings and put in something new that could be relevant and something to their interest. So I think it's one of the advantages of, of just having this reading bank to uh, prove that number from fair to good uh, or excellent just by just changing a, a reading here or there. But as I said, students seem to be satisfied with just the, after one year, just the with the OER and the uh, quality of the reading bank. But for the students themselves, when we asked about important features for the OER, uh, cost savings to them is either absolutely essential or very important. So that, you know, that still, you know, does, I think, weigh into um, our decision to keep the OERs uh, right now. Uh, as for immediate access, uh, convenience and portability, I think is another factor here as well. Uh, you'll see with the student response at the moment that uh, many of the students don't feel, you know, they, they don't have to carry a textbook with them. In fact, a lot of times they can just use their smartphone to access a reading. And I know for a lot of instructors, uh, they may think that's a distraction in the classroom, but if that um, uh, smartphone is giving them an opportunity to access an article that's already be either available as an OER or through our reading bank, uh, it you know it keeps them engaged in the class so they know what you know what they have to do for an activity or even part of the class discussion itself. So I think to have that immediate uh, access and, conven and convenience is uh, just as important. And also to the ability to print, not as important compared to convenience and access and cost savings, but it does allow students to print out a page or two if they need it. And that's where we get to the student comments uh, that, you know, the big one, yes, it's convenient, saves money. Uh, the digital allows uh, students to carry just the laptop or smartphone or whatever uh, tablet or uh, iPad, if they bring that to class, they can access the OERs with not much of an issue. Um, accessibility reasons, I think, is another factor here as well that I think is important, uh, especially when you have students that have accommodations. We want to make sure that they uh, that the OER is in compliance or does provide that accessibility for them. Uh, students don't have to per, uh, print out 400 pages of material or buy a textbook uh, you know, that's covering the, those 400 pages. They can just print whatever they need, especially if they need to annotate or highlight something uh, as part of you know, either a class discussion or maybe even their own, uh, their own reading outside of class. So, I mean, that's just, you know, some of the basic comments or at least some of the feedback that we got from students. As for faculty, uh, one of my instructors who had presented with me the other day, uh, 
you know, who couldn't be here today, but uh, did you know, want to share some of his insight here as well. So he, you know, not only just teaches comp one and two, uh, John Peabody also teaches uh, creative writing and graphic literature air as well. But with the OERs, uh, he, what he ends up doing is gives students a choice with certain assignments. So before we get to the uh, the Lumen product that he uses, he you know, wanted to, you know, go, at least he wanted to go in the direction with the reading bank, uh, which would include videos here as well. So he, you know, for an assignment, he may want students to either analyze a text uh, or analyze a video. And he gives the students that choice saying, if you want to look at a video uh, and analyze it, well, you can use this TED Talks or a TV segment or a podcast. If you want to analyze a text, you have these options to choose. So I think the power of choice, I think is really important for students, especially if you want them to do some, some type of an activity uh, that requires some sense of an analysis. So with the Lumen product, what John has done is he's used the uh, the Waymaker uh, component where you can bring in uh, quizzes or integrate quizzes into his uh, that are already been pre-made by uh, you know by Lumen, where you can bring them into the course. It could be uh, you know low risk where there's not graded, or if there's something you want something that has a little more value to it, he definitely had uh, a little more higher value to that. But uh, you know, with the question banks that come out of Lumen, again, it gives the faculty the option what they, you know, want to use as part of, uh, of the product itself. So that's, you know, one of the areas that he also brings in uh, the OERs is just the, uh, the Waymaker component. But he also brings in the readings uh, as well uh, as part of what he has it broken down into two hubs. One being a project that focuses whether uh, reading strategies, rhetorical modes, or uh, the writing process itself, whatever it may be, that's what he has identified as as such as just as a project. So, if the students you know scroll down the project hub, they're going to see all the selections that are part of Lumen. For the grammar, the other hub. He focuses solely, obviously, on grammar, punctuation, mechanics, and so forth. So whether it's pronouns, run on sentences, run on sentences, comma splices, whatever it may be, um, he can give the students that option to explore uh, any of the OERs that solely focus on grammar. So he has designed his Brightspace course a little bit different, where he has uh, uh, broken up into hubs. Some of us just integrate the links, right, uh, at least embed it right into the uh, Brightspace uh, module itself, or at least whatever we're covering that, uh, that unit. So... I so said there's many ways that you can integrate these uh, OERs into your, um, at least into your course. Uh, testimonials, uh, I had a couple here, but I'll just focus on one here. Uh, Jen Austin, who was one of the other presenters, uh, uh, couldn't be here, but she said, it's paramount to save money for our students with OERs, but I've also loved the ease and flexibility of integrating them into our learning management system, Brightspace. Uh, I was confident that the OERs would work well for my online classes since they were able to select readings, tutorials, and quizzes to integrate for each week's uh, learning outcomes. Pairing those elements with my own materials, assignments, and resources from the library. The implementation has worked especially well for hybrid courses, and students in these courses can use the OER's components to practice skills uh, as much as they would like and work with them at their pace outside of class. And then we build on those skills uh, during class time. Plus I can work one-on-one -on -one with students in the computer lab to answer questions as needed. And our OER implementation has proved to be quite successful for our students. Um, and you know, the other uh, testimonies that I had uh, up on this uh, presentation as well, pretty much echo that. Uh, so a lot of the faculty are, uh, that have adopted the OERs have been satisfied with, uh, you know, not only just with the product, but just the, also the read bank as well. So we did ask uh, faculty towards the end of uh, the spring semester, you know, what would be the important features of OERs? And um, one of those questions was, you know, I prefer to use an OER to teach my courses over a, a purchase textbook for the OER course. And this is more going to focus on comp one and comp two. Um, you know, 75%, you know, said that they agree or slightly agree. They, they do favor, uh, the OERs, uh, over the textbook itself. Uh, about 8% of them said that they could go either way, whether they say, you know, if we went back to the uh, textbook, that's fine. Uh, if you want to stay with the OER, it's fine as well. Those who strongly disagreed, the 16%, uh, these what I would say are traditional, uh, faculty that, you know, wanted to still keep the textbook, um, and and I understand why that aspect they had because they had designed all their activities, uh, assignments and, uh, and discussions around the textbook itself. So it takes a little more work uh, for for some of those faculty to just come up with uh, something new, uh, you know, working off the OER. Uh, but I think it, it just takes time for 
for I think everyone just to you know learn uh, just you know how to integrate this into their courses and how to integrate into the classroom itself. But I still think overall faculty are still happy with uh, of just the direction that we're going in right now with the OERs. And as for features, uh, again, this pretty much echoes Jen Austin's uh, presentation, or in that presentation, but testimonial as well as other faculty. Uh, maybe you do think it is cost essential for not only just our students, uh, but even then, sometimes uh, you know, faculty have to buy something. Uh, you know, we you know, through the bookstore, we do have to you know use our own money for that if needed. But uh, th for them, the important aspect is immediate access and convenience uh, to be able to go into a classroom uh, to the instructor console and just call up on the computer uh, whatever you're trying to cover that day. So I think you know between the access and convenience, I think is you know import more important for um, I think for faculty than it is for students at that at that point. As for uh, the ability of Print, again, for some of us, uh, you know, if we want to print out and, you know, highlight things, uh, you know, before we go into class, we can definitely do that. Um, but it, it's not as important, to, you know, compared to just more so having access to those uh, resources themselves. And, you know, pretty much faculty feedback that, you know, and I thought this one was really interesting and I think uh, really says a lot about learning styles and how the OERs do accommodate for all student learning styles, whether it hands on uh, visual uh, or audio, especially if you're um, working with an OER to illuminate already has a video embedded. Well, already you have the built the video and audio there. Uh, that's, you know, that's part of it. If students want to print something uh, from the OER, they can, you know, work with, you know, taking a hands-on approach by again, annotating and highlighting certain passages that come out of the, uh, the OER itself. So I think that's part, um, I think it's, you know, really important to work with the student's learning style. Ease of integration to D2L, Brightspace, I think is another uh, important factor to that uh, part of uh, OERs as well. Easy use and access in the classroom, cost less, you know, pretty much that echoes uh, the students as well. So the future is, I'm, you know, you know, looking, I got like two or three, actually more like four minutes left, uh, but I can probably get this summed up in about maybe one to two minutes. Um, so one of the things that, you know, we're doing and trying to look ahead to uh, working with uh, the OERs is, you know, we start want to start looking at course shells where uh, we can include the OERs for, especially for our new faculty, incoming faculty. Our current faculty are, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, integrated everything into their courses at this point, even with the re uh, uh, selections of readings uh, from the bank itself. But with new faculty, especially part-time faculty, uh, I want to make sure they have something that, you know, not includes the, uh, the OERs and in in possible readings, but also to making sure they have a course outline uh, in all the policies that would be needed that would go into uh, a Brightspace course uh, that any other of our faculty offer. Uh, we want to continue our ongoing collaboration with the library staff on updating the reading bank that's, you know, part of our uh, future I also want to continue to assess the OER's effectiveness, uh, especially with our other courses, uh, uh, which are, includes our ESL or ENL uh, sections of composition one and two, our enhanced composition, uh, which is basically extended class time uh, for students who need that academic support. And that would include the composition one uh, class for our, our GAP program as well. And also to uh, develop workshops through the, our college's uh, Center for Professional e uh, Excellence. So, you know, we can, um, you know, show faculty how we can use our uh, OERs effectively here as well. And that's just a couple of things that, you know, they said we're looking at regards to the future. But I said we're we're going into our second year with the pilot, or not, excuse me, not the pilot program, the, the adoption. And so we want to continue to assess it to see how this is going to work uh, for the next several years. Or if we have to, you know, maybe reconsider, go back to a textbook. But I, uh, I really think the way things are going right now with OERs uh, and faculty feedback and even student feedback, uh, the student, or, you know, faculty like it for the academic freedom, uh, the ability to choose their readings, uh, and students like it definitely for cost uh, effectiveness here as well. So that's pretty much it. I just the yeah, last thing I just want to mention is, uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you can definitely reach out to me. I still have, I can still answer some questions here this, uh, this afternoon. But I do want to give some credit uh, again. I mentioned about John Peabody for being part of the. Uh, uh, creative design around Canva. Uh, but I also want to thank my faculty uh, for being supportive on this initiative, as well as the support from uh, our Office of Distance and Online Learning and then the Marvin Library for assistance as well. All right. Thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate, um, I appreciate the presentation. That was very well done. Um, if anybody has any questions or if they want to email you're more than welcome to do so. Any finishing thoughts?
I have a question. Yeah. Hi, I apologize for coming late. Of course, the two things I'm interested in are at the same time, right? <laughs> so I was just coming over from integrated reading and writing. So um, I work at the Writing Center at Nassau Community College. So I'm interested in writing, but I also teach um, an ESL class. Um, so when you're talking about the OER, is it for synchronous, asynchronous, traditional, every modality? Every modality. So okay. it doesn't matter if you're if you're teaching in person, uh, you know, if you teach a class uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, in the Friday mm -hmm. class in the computer lab, uh, it works there. If you are teaching a hybrid class where you're meeting Monday, Wednesday, and your third contact hour is online, uh, the OER works there. Online, uh, the asynchronous works great as well. Uh, so as I said, with the pilot program, when we did it in uh, starting 2021, the fall 2021, we were starting to work with all modalities, you know, whether it was, because uh, we had just started coming back on campus at that, at that point. So we worked through remote, in-person, um, asynchronous, hybrid. We worked with all modalities. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that uh, some of our ASL colleagues are concerned that um, having ESL students work too much online, um, synchronously or asynchronously is just too tempting for translation or AI or plagiarism. Have you had that experience? That's a great question. Uh, with uh, the faculty who have been teaching um, our ESL comp, comp classes, there hasn't been much of an issue with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is pacing. Um, you know, with with the students themselves, and 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 try not to give them too much, uh, at least information, because it can be overwhelming for them. It really can. So I think it, it's just if you work in small bites, and that's why I think the one uh, textbook that I or I'm not even phrase that the OER uh, for uh, ESL writers has been really beneficial. It's it's not overwhelming uh, for for the students, and not only that, but the you know, I've seen the instruction uh, that it, it works well. I, I've seen it in action. It works well. And is that something that you're you created, or something that we could look into? Uh, one of the things I could do is I could share. Um, you know, I can download the uh, uh, Canvas slides and as a PDF, and I can email you. Email you. That would be great. I'll and just it'll have it'll have the link. You may mm -hmm. be able to have access to the link if it's done correctly. Uh, but the title of the OER is there as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And thank you so much for everybody else for being here. I will now pass it on to the next um, person. I'll have, um, I'll pass it over to Megan and then to the next presenter. Thanks, Allie. All right. 